So um, I'm now presenting this research project that has uh, something in the making, in, in the process of uh, realization, uh, is uh, a project that is a joint endeavor of uh, St. Petersburg State University and Bielefeld University in Germany. And Hello. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and uh, um, uh, also there are some colleagues uh, from other universities of Europe. For example, we have some participants from the Autonomous University of Barcelona who also participate in this project. The idea was that we invite, uh, and there are some from the uh, King's College London. So the idea is that we found some uh, teams uh, around Europe which are more or less interested in related topics. Uh, and we try to establish contact with them, some kind of cooperation, and uh, sometimes they also contribute into the data collection, and then we exchange the results and uh, probably also raise uh, different research questions, and then uh, hopefully mutually benefit from what we do together. And um, the, other, uh, the other colleagues, they also ask other artists uh, organizations, like well, from London they have other artists organizations, they well, yeah, they have all some history of research in artistic collectors or just artists or the field of uh, um, cultural production. Uh, but, for, uh, but for this project, we have uh, selected the uh, cases together because it was important that they are more or less comparable. And therefore, it was a huge, huge negotiation or discussion before we came up with the groups we focus on, because, of course, we had to check whether they do meet the requirements that we have formulated. So it was a long uh, international debate via Skype, and they also came to St. Petersburg before it was arranged. Uh, and uh, the prehistory of the... Uh, um, the project is like follows. Uh, we, uh, of course, as uh, many other sociologists, have paid attention to the fact that traditionally in sociology, like in also in the public opinion, the uh, stereotype was really, really widespread that uh, the artist is, you know, basically a lonely person uh, who is not well understood by the society and sometimes uh, counterposes the society and uh, works alone and has to stay alone to concentrate on the creative insights. So this stereotype was long uh, shared uh, not only by just people but also by sociology and it was kind of reproduced from generation to generation by many, many scholars. And uh, then it was challenged uh, in uh, 70s or 80s when it was uh, increasingly realized that uh, actually artistic uh, work is also some kind of collective work uh, and even if it is a solo project, an individual project, the artist is still uh, quite dependent on many contexts to other people from the art uh, scene and also outside the art scene, including the cultural intermediaries or uh, you know, the gallery owners or probably the curators or probably the critics or uh, also some representatives of the public and other artists. And uh, therefore, our idea from the very beginning was to see how this collectivity of artistic uh, process looks like. And uh, we actually formulated some of the research questions. Uh, what I listed on the slide is just several of them, and uh, uh, those were uh, of course uh, the way the cooperation between the artists goes. Also, uh, if uh, the artists do engage in cooperation, how it changes uh, the way they uh, interact with each other, how it influences the creative process, to which extent the collective creative process uh, differentiates from the individual one. And we also wanted to know how artists conceptualize their art, which means how they desc de describe it, which notions they use, which concepts they use by doing so how they describe their own work and the communities they belong to and also the broader art markets or art scenes that they belong to. And uh, finally, we also decided that probably it's not only the collective work that doesn't matter, but also the fact that uh, some of the artistic collectors suddenly start to share the uh, spaces, which means they can uh, either 
work together in a shared studio or in, as in the case of Frieza, they even, some of them even work together in the Künstler house or uh, sometimes uh, we now don't have this case but uh, in our previous uh, research we did have such a case they didn't have a shared studio but they had a shared exhibition space and every two weeks they exhibited together uh, dividing this uh, space between artists and uh, uh, constructing, deconstructing the exhibitions together. And uh, we also decided to uh, check what happens when in those shared spaces uh, people also share things like objects. Uh, those can be very different objects. Uh, sometimes those are artistic tools, like you know, brushes or canvases or whatever. But also artworks, because it happens sometimes that they together work on the same artworks. Uh, but sometimes those are also everyday life uh, things, like you know, this table or this glass or uh, this chair, which are all actually shared by you and by me now as well. And. Um, uh, we thought that probably those uh, things are also kind of resource for the <laughs> for the artists, yeah. And uh, of course, we also uh, were fully aware <laughs> of the uh, yeah. It's actually free, but it's just mine. Yeah, but uh, also we are aware that uh, we cannot directly compare the. Uh, um, the communities uh, to each other because of what also kind of influences or conditions uh, the way they communicate or work together is also the uh, uh, you know specific uh, structure of the uh, national and local cultural scene uh, for example uh, uh, the size of the uh, art market or whether the contemporary art is at all legitimate in the eyes of the publics or the uh, administrations or uh, whether uh, there are uh, already traditions of interactive or participatory art and many other issues. So of course this unique profile of each city and each uh, country uh, where the investigation takes place should be also somehow taken on board but here we still don't know how exactly I will come to that in my latest part of the talk. So that's what we uh, asked ourselves uh, very early when the uh, project was developing and then we tried to find out what we can do to, to, to answer those questions. So yeah, first we uh, found some theory. Uh, well, it's not such an original choice. It's actually quite traditional for sociology of art. Uh, for example, there was uh, Howard Becker who as early as 1970s, 1980s emphasized that uh, uh, all areas are part of what he called art world, which means that uh, there is a huge network of uh, people, partly professionals, partly also amateurs, who are to different extents involved in the production or commission or promotion or preservation or uh, criticizing art or cons even consuming art. And uh, together this network is very mutually dependent and each and every artist, although he or she even pretends to be very, very individual, uh, every artist is embedded in this network and influenced by this network. And another uh, theorist uh, is uh, uh, the number one French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, who uh, described art as a very complex field where different people and groups have different positions, which are higher ranking or low ranking, depending on how many or how much resources they have, or how much capitals, to use his own term. But when he speaks about capitals, he doesn't only uh, mean you know, economic capital, which is quite obvious, but also the symbolic capital in the form of recognition uh, or reputation, and also social capital, which means uh, useful connections, uh, and also cultural capital, which means education, skills, but also the possibility to uh, produce uh, uh, judgments in the field of art that will be recognized by others and accepted by the others as worth as, uh, as worthy. 
And uh, again, uh, the artists are described by Bourdieu as simultaneously colleagues and competitors. And even if you want to show how really novel and independent you are, you are still supposed to describe or explain why you are novel. And to do so, you have to first know the tradition, know the, uh, you know, the, the older uh, uh, genres or styles and to uh, step back from them. But by opposing them, you have to refer to them. So everybody is kind of involved in this uh, reference system. Uh, and uh, we decided to check that, and uh, actually you all know, or almost all of you know, what kind of uh, methods we used uh, to collect our data. We uh, first decided to focus on different art groups in European cities, but we not only paid attention to how they are innerly organized, but we also wanted to know how they uh, uh, are related to other uh, participants of the art scene, like you know, broader publics, urban environment, and uh, as a uh, form of research, we uh, designed a case study, which means that we didn't hope to get some representative data, but instead we just chose several artistic groups that were interesting for us, and we are fully aware that uh, they are quite unique, and therefore we cannot you know just take the results and expect that all other artistic groups are like that. Of course, it's not the case, but. Uh, we just see them as unique stories, so to say. But what we wanted from uh, the uh, uh, groups is that they would basically work in the form of contemporary art, and we wanted it to be predominantly visual because we hope to get more material objects, more materiality there. And uh, we also, of course, uh, wanted uh, the uh, uh, groups to be uh, more or less numerous and to uh, also to share spaces. That's, that's what I already mentioned. Uh, and all of the groups I'll show you uh, share some space, but some, but more often it's working space. Uh, in this sense, uh, Frieza is quite unique because uh, you only have, you also have uh, uh, living uh, studios in here. And um, uh, we ended up with uh, uh, Frieza in Hamburg, in, with a case in Barcelona, one in Madrid, two in St. Petersburg. Well, because it's obviously more accessible for us and one in London. And uh, we uh, also used a huge range of methods. I think everybody in the sociological world is really scared when they learn <laughs> what we do. And they feel pity about the poor artists who uh, turn out into the victims of our constant... Only one hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of our constant uh, torturing, yeah. So because it, that's uh, first the in-depth interviews with the artists, which means like talking a lot, and then we ask uh, some people to do the excursions around the space, uh, and also those awful photo elicitations, you know, when we show photos of the space and ask to comment. But we also observe a lot uh, while we are here, take photos, uh, sometimes uh, videos are not clickable. You all fulfill this uh, uh, questionnaire when we ask quite formally about whether you talk to people or collaborate to people. And then finally we have the text collected, the interviews and other things, and also publications on the website. And we uh, do the quantitative analysis of text, uh, which means we try to develop networks of the uh, ways that people describe uh, their own work and the own life. So I'll show how it results, what kind of result it gives in the end. So of course it's a huge challenge to first collect all that, then collect it not once but in several waves because we wanted to see how it changes over time. So um, unfortunately it's not our last time here either. We'll come again in half, in, in half a year. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I don't know, probably it's just a threat that you now can, cannot bear anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, also it is very difficult to, you know, uh, bring all those results together because uh, you have quite uh, a lot of information and you have to somehow uh, synthesize it, uh, systematize it, which we now try uh, to do, but we just almost finished our preliminary uh, elaboration of data from the first wave and we have uh, already started the first attempts of analysis, but of course they are by no way uh, finished or fully shaped. I will just show you a bit how we progress. 
Uh, yeah, and I'll show you what kind of cases we have. In St. Petersburg we have two. Uh, one is uh, my favorite uh, group uh, because uh, I first started to work with them even before the project in 2012. Uh, it is called Kuchnya in Russian or the Kitchen uh, in English. And it's a, quite a small group of young artists who are not so young anymore <laughs> because they were much younger when our research started. And uh, they are quite ambitious and they try to promote themselves uh, the art scene. And uh, they were uh, first sharing a space in the very center of St. Petersburg, but then they had to move to the industrial area into a loft. We changed the, their uh, relations a lot uh, and also their daily routines of work. Uh, and also through time we saw how they uh, uh, you know, experienced conflicts and well, uh, uh, the older uh, members are of my age, approximately, so they're around 30 to 35. But uh, there were two members that split from the group, uh, and uh, they had to uh, invite new members, and those are younger, they are like around 25. Uh, but what is interesting about them, that they all have, or almost all of them have the same educational background. Although there are several artistic schools in St. Petersburg, they almost all graduated from the same, and they always refer to this shared background, like something that is important for them. And um, uh, another group is also relatively young, uh, but here it is also interesting that uh, some of the people are uh, not from St. Petersburg, they came from uh, another city and uh, they knew each other even before they migrated to St. Petersburg, so they, like, one person uh, attracted the second and that, that made a network of uh, uh, people. And uh, also here you have a, a very obvious subgrouping of uh, the old timers and the newcomers. Um, and the old timers make a core and they are very uh, close uh, as friends, less so as collaborators. <laughs> yeah, but not probably as so close as you guys were <laughs> there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, for them it's of course uh, much more relative because they're existing only for several years. Uh, but uh, still, uh, that is important. They kind of, uh, you know, also distinguish between those who are just very fresh to the community and those who have worked there for a longer time. Then we have... Oh, okay, so... Oh, yeah, sorry, I have to I try to be slower then. Yeah, okay, I, I, I'll do my best then. Then we have uh, a community uh, from London. Uh, it is called South Bank Mosaic, because what they basically do is mosaic, although they're also involved in other artistic projects, uh, in painting and stuff. And... Uh, they, what is specific about the group, uh, uh, in addition to this shared studio they have, is also that they are very often working at the uh, joint projects. But those joint projects are not uh, so typical because they are actually concentrating on socially oriented art, which means that they often work with volunteers uh, from the neighborhood, uh, but also from volunteers from among uh, young offenders or you know young people who have problems with uh, with law and they actually thus cooperate also with the police or with the uh, uh, social services and <coughs> you immediately feel that in how they speak about the art as you know something that can change the world or change the society and they also feel uh, very interested in the history of the neighborhood, uh, the South Bank, that's how the South Bank of the River of Thames, and uh, they very much play with this history. For example, producing the mosaic portraits of the famous local women of different times or uh, some other projects also referring to the history. And uh, at the same time, it's strange, but uh, although they are like very open uh, out to outsiders and uh, very active in collaborating with volunteers, they as a group are very formalized, which means that they, for example, come to work uh, on specific times, like they have work hours very often, and uh, outside the working hours it's almost not possible to reach them. Uh, so, I mean, it's more... Uh, 
you know, regulated by the inner. Uh, is it like a company? They are not a company, although well, they are also you know this uh, non liability kind of organization, yeah. but and they are non commercial of course, but uh, because some of the people do get money, they are not as artists but as so coordinators. They get money for that work, for the work. Yeah, for the social work. Uh, uh, there are people who are only doing artistic work there, and there are also people who are doing some kind of coordination or marketing like not marketing, but information dissemination or uh, fundraising. And those people uh, do get uh, money. money. Yeah. Yeah. Then we, we have you, and of course it was a, a very happy choice because it's not only a, uh, unique because of the uh, uh, you know, fact that some of people live here, but also this huge history of the freezer or the older Kunstler house in Widen Ali is very attractive. Also those uh, uh, old friendships that uh, bring the community together. And also what is highly interesting for us is uh, that it is, well, quite a big, you know, uh, artistic collective, but still, uh, kind of working uh, very well for years, that was, of course, quite an interesting case for us. Then, uh, there are two Spanish cases, one in uh, Madrid, one is in, in Barcelona. Um, in, in Madrid, we have uh, the Basorama uh, story. Again, that's uh, an interesting group because they are also very often working collaboratively on joint projects. Uh, they are also doing uh, some public art. Their, their favorite um, um, uh, material for work is trash, um, quite provocatively, but also other forms of art are very attractive to them. And uh, also interestingly, Basorama, they have kind of distant members who used to work there uh, physically, but now stay in other cities or even countries. Uh, but still, on distance, they participate in projects and have the identity of being part of the Busurama mm -hmm. story. So it's, of course, again, quite unique. And finally, we have uh, this uh, case in, uh, in, in Barcelona, where uh, they also have shared studios, um, and, uh, uh, but still predominantly work on individual projects. Uh, however, sometimes, like in Fiza, they organize uh, exhibitions together, or they uh, do some kind of open days, like the one that we visited. You probably see this photo down at the bottom of the slide where we all are present, <laughs> this uh, uh, lunch that they organize together for the friends of the community and for themselves. So, uh, so this was an open door they made? Yeah, there was an open door, but the lunch was not open for everybody. The studios were open up to, say, one o'clock, then they have the siesta when they cook together, and we were kind of invited <laughs> as, you know, <laughs> privileged part of their story because they already also have wonderful relations to the part of the team which works there. They kind of, they, uh, one of the girls, they even call her uh, kind of, um, uh, stepdaughter or something <laughs> because they kind of ad adopted her um, and she even participates in one of the artistic projects of theirs uh, for now so they were, we were invited but the broader uh, public was not uh, but afterwards after the lunch again the studios were open for everybody and for friends so in the night or in the evening in the evening and in, uh, up until late in, uh, at night mm -hmm. exactly so uh, People would wander from studio to studio. I wonder whether it's similar to your Open Galaxy story. I think it is, but I have no chance to compare them for now. And uh, they would ask questions and uh, you know look at different works. And there were also some interactive projects there. For example, there is a guy, an artist, who has a studio, a very small one, but full of all things, including uh, dried uh, food, by the by. So like old bread, or grass floating on the walls, but also old clocks or dices or books or whatever. And whenever somebody comes to the studio, he asks, can you choose one of the things here that resembles you of some personal biographical experience of yours and tell uh, some story about that as a narrative. And then he like uh, videotapes that, and thus we also became part of his project because we also t t told our stories connected to what we found there. 
yeah so uh, those are the cases uh, and uh, we uh, try to see what kind of uh, things we can learn from the, from from the communication with the artists and I just of course will focus on several aspects one is what we call special benefits like many uh, people from the uh, uh, communities that we talked to would emphasize that uh, shared space is indeed very important for them uh, for different reasons. One of them being uh, that they can accumulate together the, uh, you know, the skills, uh, the knowledge and the connections that they have, but also the instruments, of course, if they uh, uh, face financial uh, risks or constraints. Uh, like, for example, one of the uh, interviewees uh, from St. Petersburg says that, uh, for example, if uh, they are young, for them it's still very important, but they emphasize that if by chance a curator or a gallery owner would uh, call into the place to see the works of one of the artists, that is absolutely inevitable. He also will learn what the others will do. And uh, of course, this means that uh, probably some other works will be attractive, used, and then new collaboration would start. And this system of. Huh? That's like Eva Hessel was um, famous. Mm -hmm. Because the curator went to the studio and he was Yeah, I think it's very, very similar to that indeed. Yeah, and uh, also um, they uh, many 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 artists would speak about the uh, importance of where the shared studios are located, like uh, which neighborhood they're in. For example, for the Russian cases, it's very important to be very central because it means that you also have uh, other related cultural sports. Uh, quite near, quite close, and so people would uh, wander from one uh, place of interest to another, and this attracts publics, and they also they tend to uh, develop into real creative clusters. For example, uh, the studio, or the older studio of the kitchen would be located uh, in uh, the building where they also have some designer showrooms and, you know, the uh, uh, cinema for uh, those uh, hybro films, and they also have some uh, some uh, ballet studio and some theater studio in there. So of course they have this uh, broader uh, interchange. In, in Spain, again, uh, they also emphasize that uh, they have some other neighboring uh, artistic or cultural uh, spots uh, nearby and they emphasize the importance of uh, the neighborhood for their work. Uh, this is especially strong for, for Madrid, where they describe their neighborhood as their home or their family, and where they try to make as much uh, participate throughout as, as possible. And also for London, of course. And uh, what we also found in the majority of the communities, uh, but for uh, London perhaps, is that, uh, interestingly, they are all more oriented towards uh, quite a narrow circle of professionals as uh, experts or viewers or uh, judges. So, uh, although you expect more, you know, uh, orientation towards interactive art or participatory art or whatever, no, they are more interested in um, the uh, recognition coming from other professionals from the field, also from um, from, from, from the uh, uh, well-known critics. And uh, it's interesting that uh, some of uh, the artists would uh, kind of uh, uh, realize that it's not such an attractive position, but still uh, speak about that openly showing that, in fact, this uh, narrow circle of uh, artistic uh, uh, world is uh, much more relevant for them. Uh, again, interestingly, it is especially true for St. Petersburg in comparison to other cities, and we uh, pr presume it is because the uh, artistic market in St. Petersburg is very narrow, very closed, very young, 
And therefore, the uh, contemporary art is by no means uh, legitimate in the eyes of the people, the more so in the eyes of the city administration, which doesn't see it as art. For Russian uh, authorities, uh, art and culture are something that old and traditional, uh, and uh, there is the heritage that you got uh, from your fathers and grandfathers, and you're supposed to preserve and give it to next generations, but... But the Russian oligarchs that buy a lot of art. Yeah, they do buy a lot of art. Mm -hmm. Extremely terrible things. Look, who was she showed in Moscow? Mm -hmm. I know, yeah, I was told by somebody. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. But uh, actually, uh, I think that uh, um, <laughs> the oligarchs are the. The problem is that uh, uh, they, of course, buy something, but they buy something that they explain is uh, attractive or will be. A, promising and they basically buy either uh, art that is already uh, expensive uh, like uh, the art from the first half of this uh, 20th century for example and uh, of course they are huge contributors to the market and they say there are so many fakes now appearing on the market just because of this uh, consumer interest coming from the oligarchs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Also, from uh, actually in China, you have a very similar uh, situation. They also have rich people who would be interested in buying something as investment. Mm -hmm. But uh, to say that there are so many oligarchs interested in very new art, which is by no means recognized as you know promising for now mm -hmm. because it's still very novel, we, I, I wouldn't say that. And. Uh, uh, Again, uh, at least for Russia, you have this uh, rhetorics of uh, people saying, okay, there is the commercial uh, art that you would exhibit in commercial galleries, that's not us. And uh, we are not interested in such kind of things. We are proud of being non-commercial. We don't strive for commercial success. So, and you never know, either it is indeed a position of being so non-commercial, or it is uh, like in this old fairy tale about the uh, uh, fox and the uh, sour grapes, you know, which uh, the, when the fox doesn't reach the grapes, she can't, but she say, okay, I didn't want it because it's too sour, right? So, because they j just cannot reach it, they try to come for themselves, so you don't know. Um, and uh, what we also discovered in many cases is the uh, strategic choice of exhibition platforms. Uh, for example, uh, in many cases you have like a mental map of the artistic uh, scene of the city when uh, uh, the artists say, okay, I know that some galleries are good, some galleries are not good, and even if I can, I would never exhibit in a gallery which I find uh, a bad one, uh, the one that works with the wrong audience or the one that uh, uh, probably is too commercial. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, oh, I'm fond of this uh, quotation, uh, like uh, sometimes if you're ex exhibiting in the bad gallery or in the wrong gallery, in the, uh, in the salon gallery, then it's like a stigma for you mm -hmm. and other people, uh, other artists from the, from the arts would never ever forgive you or they remember it for the end of times. So you have to be very careful about that, <laughs> at least in some of the city, European cities. And, um, and it, actually, it's very relevant, again, for the smaller markets, uh, artistic markets, because then everybody knows everybody, but also for the younger artists who are just beginning, because they are really, really uh, reflexive about how their art market works, and they are really, really scared to make a mistake. They feel insecure there. And for them, actually, the community might be also a kind of you know, helping hand that would, pre would prevent uh, them from doing such, from making such mistakes by, uh, by, by get getting help from more experienced uh, members. Uh, and also, uh, uh, what I find very interesting is uh, what I call the sense of one's place, um, which is, uh, again, you have this mental map of the attractive uh, exhibitions and uh, you have some exhibitions where I would really want to exhibit, but you still feel you're not uh, developed enough or not uh, reputed enough to do so. So you kind of uh, try to define which uh, uh, exhibitions or galleries or whatever are the best from what you can afford for, for now, 
uh, taking consideration your experience, your reputation, your uh, your previous career, and uh, uh, by balancing, you just choose your uh, future path. And uh, it's also interesting to see how the artists would describe the reasons why they are part of the community or joining the community. Uh, uh, well, for younger artists, this, this uh, mistakes prevention, but uh, what is also very important uh, is also to gain uh, informational and emotional support. Uh, many artists, including the freezer, would say that uh, uh, here you don't have to explain what is art and why you are doing art, and uh, of course it's clear for everybody, and if you are uh, experiencing a failure or probably not understood by the audience, you still get the emotional support from the colleagues. And uh, actually many uh, people from very different communities, from different cities, would use very similar concepts to describe the, uh, their community, for example, as uh, uh, family or um, uh, shelter, so to say, like uh, protection uh, structure, or they sometimes would say that is a community that ar uh, arises out of the need, from the necessity, of, uh, like uh, not Gemeinschaft, uh, um, <laughs> Uh, uh -huh. uh, so that, that, that we never saw, although people would of course speak about solidarity or uh, I don't know, uh, identity, they all do, uh, they compare the uh, group to the family quite often, but uh, solidarity community, no, that, 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 that's not the case, but uh, you can actually have something as Schutzgemeinschaft or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, everybody is quite aware that uh, people can enjoy more infrastructure by sharing. And it's also the case for many places, including the Frieza. And uh, there's also the possibility to accumulate and share different material resources, but also symbolic resources. Sometimes you can promote yourself by basing on the reputation of the community at large. Or you can uh, gain a better opportunity to exhibit or participate in a collective exhibition just because you are part of the group. Uh, or you can be uh, getting some uh, support uh, or help from the more reputed or more uh, experienced members in the preparation of uh, projects and so on and so forth. But uh, in some cases, it's also uh, the way to overcome the deficiency of uh, debate on how your work is. Because, uh, well, it's not uh, really uh, such a strong need in the uh, countries and cities where you have a broader and older tradition of art making, a contemporary art making, where you have quite many critis, critics and where you have quite an active cultural life, where you have loads of exhibitions and openings and, you know, networks and several uh, uh, artistic houses in the city. But, for example, again, for us it is very topical because, again, the artistic market is so closed that first, the level of competition is very high, of course the resources are very scarce, you have only a very limited uh, number of places where you can exhibit or uh, sell, but also because they so close, everybody knows everyone. I don't know, uh, well, it's also part of the case for other cities, but for St. Petersburg it's like the strongest. And uh, if you criticize, it, it's of, co of course offensive, it's like make, getting too personal, and uh, then uh, the chances are very low that uh, you get any productive feedback or advice or criticism. And then if you are grouping up in a community, you hope that at some point you still try start to discuss, comment, uh, reflect about the, uh, the art and so on and so forth. And some of the artists openly say that they feel they overcome this deficiency by being part of the group. Um, yeah, and finally, what is also interesting, but it's not the case for Frieza, it's the case for uh, 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 Spain, also for uh, Russia, is that many uh, 
communities would define themselves or describe themselves in a kind of comparison to or opposition to other art groups of the city. And they do so, of course, by ascribing positive features to themselves and by prescribing negative features to uh, the others. Uh, like, for example... Like rap music. Hmm? Sorry? Rap, rap music. It's a theme of rap music. They always uh, <laughs> write a song about other rap music musicians and mm -hmm. say, they're bad, but I'm good. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a big tradition. Yeah, no, I think no, it's, no, a, it's a bit yeah, similar, no, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's very true, yeah. And <laughs> yes, and uh, 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 it seems that the higher the level of competition for, you know, for administrative support, also for financial support, but also for the public, those, you know, half, five and a half people who come to the exhibitions, the stronger this... Uh, uh, discourse of, uh, of uh, stigmatizing the other. For example, uh, some groups would uh, blame others to be too commercial or too politically impartial, uh, too politically engaged, politicized. Uh, or uh, others would say that uh, uh, the older groups are too conservative, they never produce anything novel already, they are repeating themselves. Yeah. Might, might be, actually, yeah. Where do we are stigmatized? Ah, yeah, I have to go to the Ganga Field and ask whether uh, you are too conservative in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yesterday I, I talked to Christina and they have a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. You see, yeah. Yeah, and all, but if you are not so commercialized and not politically partial, uh, then you can get the blame uh, of being too, not, not uh, ambitious enough or, you know, <laughs> being too yeah. passive. Yeah. So it's like a, that's yeah, why I do it as a, as a round, because it's like a circle of uh, opposing your own group to, to the other yeah. groups. Um, uh, and, uh, okay, and then that's what we already done because it's qualitative analysis, but we also try to do it quantitative by building networks. Uh, the first thing that we do is try to see how people within communities interact with each other. That's why what this questionnaire works for when we ask about whether people talk to each other or uh, collaborate or feel emotional attachment to each other. And in the end, we have such networks. Uh, that's one of the groups from St. Petersburg. So you, that's uh, the communication network. Uh, we see whether to which extent people do talk to each other regularly, like one, yeah, once a week and more. Uh, and then uh, we'll have uh, similar networks concerning collaboration, which are normally more used because people collaborate uh, more rarely than just talk or have conversations. And then finally we have emotional attachment and th those networks are very different sometimes because it's not necessarily the case that you like the people you are regularly working with or talking to. Although of course the chances are higher, but sometimes the uh, emotional networks are more vast, more intense because people do like even those who are rarely participating in the uh, collective conversation. It's interesting because there's one with six connections and I think five, it's five yeah. So yeah. they are yeah. quite unique. Yeah. Your, uh, your, your office is C, for example, <laughs> that uh, you have uh, yeah, that you have <laughs> that you have a core <laughs> yeah, important importantly, and you have the peripheral more peripheral others that are almost isolated from the uh, communication. Uh, either because they are newcomers or because they are kind of falling out of the collective project. But I also see that some of the artists are kind of uh, the core of the core, the stars of the networks. But here we don't have that because this uh, subgroup is very closely connected to each other. Sometimes you do feel that one artist is really, really in the center and without him it, nothing will ever work. For example, in Salvet Mosaic, 
you have a definite leader, he's also a formal leader, uh, and he doesn't really work artistically too much, he is more involved in, you know, uh, outer communication with uh, volunteers, with administration, with commissioners, and he also writes loads of books about uh, the community, and sometimes he helps about the artistic work, but more in technical terms, like, for example, preparing tiles for the uh, mosaics but without him nothing works and everybody refers to him everybody marks him so it's like he's in the very middle and others would depend on, uh, on like him communicating mm -hmm. <laughs> no like now. no well actually uh, many people are rather central and please you have quite a symmetric structure uh, oh, I don't want to show you. I, oh, why I, not? Yeah, why, why? Because I know that it would progress. It would influence, it would influence the, the, yeah, the study. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm trying to. Never talk to that again. That person again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I made this kind of diagram already mm -hmm. with um, rubber strings mm -hmm. and nails. So you know how it looks. I know. <laughs> And interesting, yes, it changes. So now we almost have collected the questionnaires for the second wave, and we do see that some connections do change. So yeah. in the end, of course, when everybody, everything is ready, we'll show everything to, 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 to everybody. Uh, but for now, uh, I only will show you uh, how uh, the situation with the shared concepts would look oh. like. So uh, we also wanted, like, we collected all the interviews that we could, and also the text that uh, you wrote, you know, for other purposes, like uh, um, I don't know, for, for websites and or books, and it, we asked whether there are uh, like uh, concepts, big uh, that uh, the people would share. And here we have some of the concepts that everybody shares, like like the, the majority of the group. Uh, uh, there are almost uh, 800 concepts that. Uh, uh, almost everybody in the group would use uh, w w while speaking to us. Well, yeah, that's, that's 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 a big number. It's Which bigger than. Abel? Yeah, Abel? no, 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 no. Abor is, is not there. We actually deleted all those, you know, Abors and uh, Klein uh, and uh, <laughs> some 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 ordinary words that are very. Also, der die das ist nicht dabei. Nein, nicht Aha. dabei. Uh, auch er sie solche Sachen. Yeah. 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 A, those, those are these not words, but the cores of the words. Because sometimes when you are speaking, you can say, okay, Tochter or no, you can use singular or plural, or you can uh, use different endings. And if uh, you don't count that, then the uh, cinema machine would uh, differentiate them as different words, which you cannot allow. So you have to. You made this diagram. This is made by a machine? Yes, it's made by a machine. So first we have to transcribe all the texts, then we have to clean them to uh, uh, bring away all those, you know, unnecessary words. Then we have to go through the process of cleaning by deleting the endings and stuff. And then finally the machine would uh, uh, analyze that and bring up the shared concepts. And then with another program we can build such networks, mm -hmm. visualize them. Hmm? Yeah, that's, uh, for, me, for me it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Why? 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 <laughs> Actually, uh, we still have like loads of uh, uh, artistically related uh, uh, issues such as uh, uh, Künstler or Künstler House mm. or, or uh, uh, you know, Project or form or Ausstellung, uh, uh, and actually there are also many shared notions that are uh, connected with how the life is organized in Frieza, like Vorstand or Dugnat uh, uh, by the by some other things. And hmm? what is the most uh, used text? Uh, word? Where Künstler? Künstler. Mm -hmm. Also Arbeit, Arbeit. Uh, uh, Künstlerwerk, Werk, stuff like that. Yeah, but actually we are now trying to understand uh, how, what are the uh, words, the concepts that would be used together, like as combinations. That's what I will bring next time to you to see how they are interconnected to each other. 
We also are now trying to learn whether there are uh, uh, some connections between who uses them. For example, is it true that friends or people who are collaborating together use more similar vocabulary? And you'll see uh, some preliminary uh, conclusions about that. What do you mean when you say we try to learn if there are connections between words? What, no. what do you mean by learning? No. Uh, or to, or to get to know, to find to out, to, to find out. Oh, okay. So the idea is we now know who is communicating to whom, who is friends to whom, who is collaborating to whom, and we want to find out whether the people who are uh, tied with those connections tend to use uh, similar uh, concepts when describing their own work, the art world, the communities they belong to. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it depends. It depends on the community and the structure of the community. Uh, and we also, as you probably know, tortured you with uh, what things you use. And we are also... Hmm? Yeah, that those are networks of things, so to say, uh, which are co-located or uh, which we observed or you told us that they are used together functionally or whatever. And there are groups of uh, objects, for example, one group will be located here in the air because you have all the tables and chairs and... Uh, 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 glasses and you know uh, dishes yeah, everything, yeah. everything yeah but also uh, there is a big uh, group of things uh, outside where the bench are located then there is the bar group so to say uh, the less so in the uh, Ausstellungs around because it's so very often empty but you bring things in there and then there are some groups uh, in the studios which we hope to develop and again, uh, the question is, okay, quite clear that in ateliers, in the studios, uh, it's uh, quite a few people who would use the same objects. But in the shared space, as say in the uh, bar space and freezer, uh, do, do we still expect that uh, people who are working more or collaborating more or uh, communicating more would, use, would tend to use uh, the same objects more often? And it turns out that, uh, at least in the case of Freezer, it's not the uh, uh, communication that matters, but the friendship. So the friends do tend to use the similar objects somehow. And uh, uh, collaboration is more important for other communities, especially those who are working on the same projects. Because then, as a working group, you do share the same instruments and the same uh, artworks, which are also objects. Uh, uh, that's <laughs> what we have in the end. Uh, we, in the end, will bring together people, the red spots, the uh, concepts that they share, the, the green yellow things, and finally the objects, and see how the three things go together. That's our most ambitious aim in the end. But we are now working on that. But it, at least it looks aesthetically appealing. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the uh, cases. It looks very physics. much like quantum physics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? What, what the virus. Uh, ah, the virus. <laughs> I think yeah, quantum physics is I think quantum physics is more positively. <laughs> but interesting that the structures of different uh, communities look really differently. For example, in Freezer you have the uh, more groups of objects. Like, because uh, here in uh, North uh, Seven you have all the studios shared and therefore you just have quite a sp uh, uh, equal dissemination of objects between people. And here objects uh, are only located in certain spaces that are jointly used and you immediately see that when they're looking at the picture because they're grouped up. Uh, and, uh, uh, Yes. Yeah, the box of, actually, there are, there are some uh, things that are all, all used by almost everybody and that you immediately see that. Uh, yeah, and when we tried to compare across cases, uh, we came to very, very pre preliminary observations. For example, uh, Freeze is leading, it's one of the leading groups uh, uh, which has the highest level of shared uh, vocabulary, uh, also uh, it's not only the words that they would, uh, that you guys would use um, uh, 
identically. But it's also we, we also look at in which context they they appear and uh, which uh, notions are uh, normally used together, like in combination. Because you know, if you only look which words people are using, it can be very primitive. Because you can use the word of künstler when speaking about your own personal career, or when speaking about a uh, bad artist, or when speaking about a novel artist, or when speaking about a voice, whatever. Uh, so uh, we have to see in which uh, surrounding each and every concept appears. And in Frias, it's not just that the vocabulary is similar, but also the people is, uh, tend to group up uh, concepts similarly. And they hold the second position in this uh, uh, range of cases of uh, six cases. Uh, and uh, actually, we see that the longer the history of the community and the stronger the emotional ties within the community, then uh, the uh, higher this level of similarity, so to say. <laughs> yeah, but on this, on this, on the same, in the same time. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and at the same time. Uh, there is the, the, the community that is leading, absolutely leading in this uh, uh, sharedness and uh, similarity of uh, uh, conception, concepts is uh, the one that is not so old, but the one that has very many collaborations. So collaborations uh, are even stronger factor of uh, uh, development of the same artistic language uh, uh, than uh, you know, long history or uh, friendships. Uh, and uh, we also also now try to see how the groups are structured internally, and uh, we look at whether the, those subgroups differ in how they describe their work and how they use things. And it, it turns out that indeed in each group you can find some substructure. Uh, very often those are old timers and newcomers. Sometimes the, there are people who work uh, on the same project and who don't. Sometimes uh, those are uh, boundaries that go along the forms of art that people would use. Sometimes it's education, like in this uh, case in St. Petersburg, where you have people who are graduated from the same uh, school of art and the ones who are not from there and you definitely see that uh, in the uh, way they speak about their own works. And uh, we are now trying to develop more classifications within groups to see how it influences the communication. Uh, and also, uh, it, it seems probably very funny for you when we are asking, okay, do you use this, do you water this plant or uh, how often do you sit at this table? But indeed, it turns out that, uh, in a certain sense, the everyday life objects are not are not uh, less important than the, the artistic objects that the artist would uh, produce. Because, uh, as in Frieza, if you have this constant drift of shared things in everyday life, like instruments or uh, books or um, whatever, because you have actually a drift of everything. <laughs> Uh, then it is still very much influencing the way people talk to each other because they are interconnected. They have this additional uh, flow of uh, connection that you never realize is there, but which still matters. Uh, and um, on the other hand, uh, the uh, uh, things that are shared and that are connected with artistic work, especially the shared art objects, or uh, those uh, objects that are related to the shared projects are much, much stronger conceptualized, which means people speak about them a lot, they reflect on them a lot, you have more concepts concerning those objects, people describe them in more details. Uh, uh, for example, uh, they would uh, describe some joint mosaic or some joint uh, installation in many more details and we have more associations with that. And uh, I think that uh, Probably uh, because we have already collected all the interviews for the second wave, so I won't influence you now. Uh, we'll get much of the uh, reflection and conceptualization of the uh, forthcoming book in Freezer uh, as a shared project, and which will be materialized somehow as a publication. Because it's something in the making, something that people would uh, jointly do and uh, reflect. It changes a lot and even provides new 
you know, new, new, collab new collaborations and new uh, solidarities. Um, yeah, that's basically what we found out. Uh, and uh, I also only wanted to emphasize this challenge, which we don't know how to tackle yet, because of course it's clear that uh, uh, there are some similarities across cases, but it's also some differences. Sometimes they're internal and it's easier to work with them, uh, because uh, you can, of course, uh, take into account that uh, the members of the communities are of different ages, or the communities have different uh, histories, or you know that uh, some communities are more socially oriented than the others. So this can somehow reflected in the analysis. But we still don't know how to include the dimension of the, the difference of the local and national context. For example, in St. Petersburg, we have uh, the following uh, features of the art market. That it is very small with dense social ties, that is very closed, that it is uh, expressly non-commercial, that we don't have this developed discursive field of debating about art, and uh, you don't get any support from the uh, from the from the state or non-governmental organization, or you get it just occasionally, and you're kind of surprised of that, and you know there's more bureaucracy than profits out of this collaboration. And it immediately uh, reflects in the ways people speak about that. For example, one of the shared uh, concepts of Frieza would be Kulturbehörde, clearly, because they play an important role in the life of the community. And uh, actually, uh, the surrounding notions are also quite uh, expressly showing the importance of Kulturbehörde, like Projekt or, or Geld or uh, uh, Unterstützung and so on and so forth. And in St. Petersburg, you will hardly find uh, the notion of uh, officials in, in, in there in, in, in the rhetoric, because they're kind of falling out of the art scene. They are non-existent. And uh, you don't know how to tackle that, how to introduce the difference of the broader context into analysis. Or another example, uh, well, it seems now that it is also more or less typical for other cases, including with the freezer. But for Russia, it is especially true that artists are unbelievably polyfunctional, which means they do everything. They create art, they job for money, they uh, work as kind of organization, uh, organizers or coordinators or quasi-curators. They write uh, texts for themselves, they t write texts about each other because nobody else would do that. Uh, they would... Um, come to each other exhibitions, making the public, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, they really undertake many of the <laughs> tasks. Uh, well, I do know that in Frieza, for example, many of you would also make many of those things, but uh, this poly polyfunctionality in St. Petersburg, especially forest, especially uh, dependent on the pressures. And, uh, and then this uh, popularity of interactive art uh, we, where you hardly find any uh, interesting initiatives in the field of uh, interventions or performances or public art, it starts to develop but very slowly. So how do you introduce this unique profile of a city or a country into the analysis when you already have so many differences across cases internally? So we're now trying to reflect on that because otherwise the analysis would be not really uh, complete. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's uh, a greeting from St. Petersburg from the uh, kitchen case. Um, <laughs> can arrange that. Yeah.